Welcome to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. I'm Paul Brickner, head of U.S. Policy and Strategic Advocacy for the Electric Coin Company. In a few moments, I will welcome our guest, Kristen Smith, Executive Director of the Blockchain Association. We believe in fostering a respectful and inclusive environment for our discussions, and while we, Electric Coin Company, have strong opinions about the need for private and confidential financial transactions in crypto, our guests may have differing views. Through these thought-provoking and at times challenging conversations, we aim to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards creating pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not legal or financial advice. Our guest remarks may not reflect those of their organization or of Electric Coin Company. Thank you for joining and enjoy the podcast. It's my pleasure to welcome Kristen Smith, the CEO of the Blockchain Association, to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast. Kristen, welcome. It's great to be here, Paul. I'm so glad you're here. And what an interesting time to have you here. (laughs) It has been an interesting week. So we're going to dig into a lot of that. But first, let me introduce you in case some of our viewers and listeners aren't familiar with you. You are the CEO of a Washington, D.C.-based trade association representing more than 100 of the industry's leading companies. You serve on the board of the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. You're a liaison between policymakers and the cryptocurrency industry, and you assist in the creation of legislation and regulation that promotes growth of the cryptocurrency ecosystem in the US. And you're also a leading voice advocating for the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry through top tier media interviews, op-eds, and letters to the editor and global speaking engagements. And I can attest to this because I see you all over the place all the time. I don't know how you manage it, to be honest. It is really quite amazing what you do. You are a renowned voice for the industry having been featured on Fortune's 2020 40 Under 40 lists, Coindust's 2021 50 People Who Defined the Year in Crypto, and Cointelegraph's 2022 Top 100 Influencers in Crypto and Blockchain. Just amazing what you're doing for the industry. Prior to leading the Blockchain Association, you helped blockchain and technology companies achieve their public policy objectives in Washington, and you served as a Senate and Congressional aide on Capitol Hill for nearly 10 years, much of which was spent focusing on technology policy. I just am so excited to have you here. So thankful. Yeah, well, Paul, and you have been so wonderful to work with because you and I have gone back many, many years. But I think uh, in particular, like I've been so impressed with everything that you've done at Electric Coin Company. And I think that uh, you really have single-handedly changed the conversation around privacy in Washington. I mean, this was a conversation that I think before you got involved really wasn't happening. And I I just kudos to you. It's been like really awesome to see that we've been able to bring so many people together and um, really expand um, the number of minds that are thinking about this uh, and these like super important issues, um, you know, not um, just for crypto, but I think for all of humanity. I mean, I think we're dealing with some really powerful technology that can, um, you know, really improve the lives of people all around the world. So thank you for all that you do as well. Wow. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I should mention that uh, I'm not doing this alone. I have a great team at Electric Coin Company. And in fact, my colleague, Gary Weinstein, who partners with me on this podcast, can't be here today. So I'm uh, taking over the mic, but he'll be back with us. And I um, want to acknowledge that he's doing some amazing work on the global regulatory front. So with the two of us and with the Blockchain Association and our colleagues, we're trying to pull together a community of people to really move crypto and blockchain forward. Let's just dive into a little bit of this week. I have here with me um, the Politico Morning Money, and it is literally almost all about crypto and blockchain. Who would have dreamed of that five years ago? Even 18 months ago. Right. Yeah. It is It is truly incredible. Uh, and I know that some of what's happened this week has just been so recent that you're probably still taking it in and and, and trying to understand all that's happened. Yeah, no, listen, I think it's interesting. I, um, as, as I look back in my, you know, approximately five years or so that I've been working in this space and four, four and a half uh, of which have been at Blockchain Association, um, you know, there have been these issues that, that sort of define 
periods of time. I mean, I think when I started, there was a, a budding congressional interest around the securities law issue when we saw the introduction of the Token Taxonomy Act. And that was maybe not a perfect piece of legislation, but it signified for the first time that, hey, wow, there's some people in Congress that that might be with us here in crypto. Um, but then, you know, we sort of moved forward over time and there were other periods we had, um, you know, sort of a negative time when there was an attack on self-hosted wallets and, um, you know, we had to band together and lobby the Treasury Department and, um, you know, threaten to sue uh, the Treasury Secretary. And, and um, that was a battle that that I think we won. Um, there was a big infrastructure battle over tax reporting rules and, you um, and trying to determine, um, you know, what types of entities needed to report to the IRS. And, you know, I think that was a very, very important debate because it really galvanized the broader crypto community, I think, for the first time. Um, you know, last year was kind of the first time we looked at the market structure regulation and what do we do about spot markets and where should that be? And that that kind of, you know, morphed into the DeFi space. And, and that was... Um, interestingly kind of an industry on industry battle as well um largely because ftx was pushing um, policies that i i believe were really bad for the industry and where that's left us is ftx uh when they imploded back uh at the end of last year um uh left a really sour taste in in the mouth of policymakers you know across washington i mean i think we have you know, if we look at Congress, we have a core group of of policymakers that are really with us. But now there's a whole bunch that feel, uh, you know, that they need to pay attention to these issues for the first time. And the only thing they know is what they've read in the headlines on FTX. And so they don't understand fundamentally what decentralization is. They don't understand, um, you know, the security benefits that you get of decentralized networks. They don't understand how privacy can be protected using these networks. Or they, they just have no real understanding of what it is that we are we're all trying to build. Um, and so um, but taken beyond Congress, I think I think for a long time and this might sound a little conspiracy theory, you can you can push back against me, Paul, if you disagree. Um, the you know, I think I think. There's been a sentiment amongst some of the the banking regulators, and and it's not necessarily the the people who are appointed at the top. But if you go a little bit down into sort of what I guess we're calling the permanent government now, as a, is that the new name for the deep state? I guess, um, you know that that crypto assets don't give them enough control, and that they like to have control over the financial institutions that they regulate and and the financial system and. There, there are some good policy reasons for that, right? Like they want to be able to to fight crime and they want to be able to make sure that the dollar is strong. And, you know, if, if this crypto thing has shown up and they don't know what to do with it, right? Because it just sort of upends their ability to control this process. Well, I think what an unfortunate result of uh, FTX is that it has empowered uh, these these banking regulators um, and financial regulators generally, including the SEC, to get much more aggressive in the tactics they use to try to, you know, bring regulation to crypto. Um, I don't have to tell you, you you know very well that there is a lot of regulation today uh, that is already um, imposed upon intermediaries in the crypto space and that um, a lot of the activity that happened with FTX um, is is already illegal in the U.S. And in fact, I think you know that's the reason why um, you know Sam was so quickly uh, arrested and uh, extradited here to the U.S. Um, and, and whatnot. But um, but but it's really empowered them. And I think what's what's concerning to me is that there is no regard for an open process um, among. Um, you know, this sort of group of financial regulators, I think, um, you know, we've seen the SEC for years um, has been very interested in, you know, sort of regulating by enforcement. And we can go into a little bit more. We saw that yesterday with the, the or this week with the um, uh, Kraken uh, staking um, settlement. Um, you know, if you sort of look at what the Kraken settlement, yeah, it certainly sends a bad signal. It's very bad headlines. You know, there's debate as to whether or not what Kraken was doing was a security. You know, maybe they could have like done that differently. Um, and just because the SEC brought that settlement or came to that settlement with Kraken doesn't mean that Coinbase and Figment and other companies 
won't be able to continue on. And so it'll continue to be a little bit of a dance in terms of how to do it. But I, I don't think it's the end of staking as a service in the United States. But, you know, it's definitely going to, you know, it brings the risk level up quite a bit more. And I think there's going to be, you know, more thinking and maneuvering to try to figure out how can those products be offered going forward. Um, I think what's unfortunate about what the SEC did is Kraken can't do that exploration going forward. That that doesn't seem right to me. Um, you know, there's been no guidance on how to do this. Um, you know, this is clearly something that consumers want access to. And, um, you know, they should be able, I think, to take another crack at it. No pun intended, but um, <laughs> um, um, so yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be some rough headlines. But I think when you wake up in the morning and have had a chance to digest it, you realize okay, there's still a path forward here. Um, it's 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 obviously not ideal, but um, you know, we'll continue to work through it. And you know, I think if we can get to the next election, um, you know, we may see kind of a change. You know whether it's the Biden administration or another administration, um, you know, we may start to see personnel changes with some of these regulators, and that'll always bring a fresh opportunity to get, um, you know, some fresh fresh clarity and fresh thinking. Yeah, the Kraken settlement seems to be just a shocking example of regulation by en- enforcement. Yeah. And I, I think that you pointed to um, the statement of Commissioner Peirce about that and just pointing out all the issues that you just described. There's no process here. Yeah. Um, but also, I think the other interesting thing that happened um, uh, recently is is the banking regular regulators sort of coming together and saying, you know, hey, banks, be very careful about getting into crypto related activities. Um, we think there's a lot of risks there. That was followed at the end of January by a policy statement that was a little bit more direct in saying, you know, well, one, state banks, you can't do anything that federal banks aren't allowed to do. And, um, you know, federal banks, you aren't um, allowed to, you know, keep crypto assets on your own balance sheet, which basically means you can't, they can't do crypto lending. They can't, uh, you know, um, they can't own Bitcoin as as part of one of their own assets. It, it, it really sends a signal that, that they should stay out of it. Um, you know, simultaneously, we've seen rumors that the OCC, um, another banking regulator, is is really hesitant to, to grant, um, you know, charters that, you know, are provisional charters into, into more permanent charters, um, you know, and those are obviously, um, uh, there's a couple of companies that are that are in play right there that that are, you know, that, that is hanging in the balance. Um, but going back to the Fed, this policy statement that they issued, interestingly, they posted it in the Federal Register a week later as a final rule. Well, a final rule is like a pretty permanent thing, right? And typically final rules are preceded by a notice of proposed rulemaking and open comment periods, et cetera. And to um, take what was sort of a suggestion that they stay out of these activities and put it in final rule form, I think is really, really disconcerting because there is no process around it. It is a major policy change. This is something that should be open uh, to the public for comment, for vetting, et cetera. And so I think it's these sort of tactics of trying to, I mean, I think the phrase I've seen, I've seen used is sort of regulation by blog post, right? Um, You know, they're just sort of declaring these policies without legislation, without a rulemaking process, um, or without any way for public input to happen. Now, um, the good news is, I think, you know, we do have some resources at our disposal, right? I mean, we are a country of laws and rules. And I think that we have a First Amendment, we have a Fourth Amendment, Uh, We have the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, You know, I think there's a lot of ways that we can fight back in the courts. Um, I think there's political pressure that we can get Congress to apply for them to undo these things. Um, You know, we we have some options at our disposal. But, you know, it's very clear that we have have the next year is going to be a lot of battles. Um, You know, we're going to see a lot of um, resistance to crypto, I think, from across the government. Um, but, you know, I think with the work you're doing and the work we're doing and the work that the broader crypto community is doing here in Washington, like, I, I think we'll get through this and beyond this. But we have to remain incre- incredibly 
um, you know, sort of vigilant and we have to be really strategic in picking which ones of these battles that we we push back on um, because because there's there's a, a lot going on right now. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very precarious time. Absolutely. And I, I is I think it's really interesting to just step back a bit and look at this from how technology policy has progressed in previous examples in history and internet policy, for example, and then look at how it's so different now and the dynamics to how they've changed now that it's more both technology, internet, and then finance and economic policy. We've both been in the policy ecosystem for a long time, probably going on 20 years or so, maybe more. And it is, to me, it's just remarkable that a technology that is so transformative and there's so much potential that we're getting so much backlash. And just not long ago, we had the executive order come out from the White House, which gave people some hope. I was a little skeptical, but it gave people some hope that, okay, we're on the right track. There's a recognition of the innovation. And then now we have another order, not an order, but um, the administration's roadmap to mitigate crypto- yeah. cryptocurrencies risks come out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I know you've spent a lot of time working on internet policy throughout your career as well. And and I remember, you know, I, I started in the early 2000s um, as a very junior Capitol Hill staffer working on these issues. And one of the kind of perennial issues that came up every couple of years was extending the internet tax moratorium because we didn't want to have to tax the purchases on the internet too much yet and because it was in its nascent state and nobody wanted to sort of bog that down. And that, that was an, a proactive piece of legislation that Congress passed every two years, right? Um, you know, there, there were there are many examples of, of things like this where Congress was like, let's keep our hands off of it and let this grow and develop. And and I think, you know, the the challenge I think we have with with crypto assets in is that um you know, I think if you look at the way information is regulated, f- financial services is a much more heavily regulated industry in general, right? Um, there's there's a lot that can go wrong. There's a lot that has gone wrong throughout history. And so, you know, when I look at um, crypto assets, I see peer-to-peer networks. I see the foundation for a better internet. I see a better way to do transactions that that, you know, sort of liberates money and, and frees it from the grasp of government. I mean, I think that's that's probably a good thing. Um, I think of, um, you know, I think if, if we've look at, looked at how f- financial services policy has evolved, it, it just continues to erode our privacy. Um, and, you know, there's reporting, massive reporting that goes on to the government about large transactions. Uh, it's starting to creep as inflation is going up and those number those thresholds aren't going up. Um, we've seen um, data that the IRS is collecting for incredibly small transactions and and we're, we're getting into a world where um, you know the, 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 the government seems to want to have a total picture into your financial life and and that's a really kind of scary place to be. And again, this isn't because um, you know, we, you know, their motives are good, right? I mean, their, their their motives are we want to solve crime and we want to make sure people aren't evading taxes. But there are some um, very dangerous consequences to having all of that information available to governments. And and I think that crypto can be an answer to that. Um, I also think crypto is doing some really, you know, it's, it's a giant software platform in many cases, right? It depends on which network you're looking at. But this is a this is a powerful tool for people to build on. And I think having these private property rights on the internet has a tremendous potential for new economic activity that didn't exist before. And we, sh- we should be wanting to encourage this. And I think there are some policymakers in Congress that do want to encourage this. But there are also, I think, some within the government that really like to have all of the information. Um, and um, I think that, you know, even though in the past we had you know, much more protections that over time have been eroded. I think they they like where that trend is going and they don't want to give up the grasp of, of all of that information. But yeah, I, I, you may have some additional thoughts as well in terms of, of the internet and why it is. But yeah, I can only just think that they, crypto is associated with financial services and, and they sort of like the system that they have, they meaning the government, and they don't want to give up control of it. Brings up a couple of interesting <laughs> ideas in my mind. 
first of all, it, it's, I think, somewhat ironic that a lot of the issues that we see government struggling with in technology issues today, um, technology policy today, is around privacy. It's around how privacy was not protected in the early days of the internet and how massive amounts of data were collected on people and now are actually manipulating people. And it's the opposite. <laughs> it has the potential to be the opposite, but yet we're not letting that, we're not wanting to go in that direction, yeah. it seems. Well, I guess with financial services, it's the opposite, right? Right. Um, I think from the government perspective, there seems to be, at least maybe not within Congress, but yeah, there, there doesn't seem to be a desire to protect privacy, right? Like they seem to want to have all of this information. Um, though I guess you could say that on, on the, on, on just sort of the internet information side as well. But, um, but yeah, it's, 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 I also think it's ironic too, because the problems we see like with big tech today can be solved with crypto networks. And so getting the right policies in place to allow these to thrive will empower individuals' privacy over their like online data and, you know, I mean, that this is the the solution. Um, but then you have these financial, um, you know, sort of regulatory policies that are getting in the way um, of, of making that happen. Um, but again, nothing that we can't work our way through and ultimately, um, you know, overcome. But it, it certainly throws a wrench in the gears in terms of getting these networks, I think, deployed and adopted. Um, um, but that's why you and I are here. I love your optimism. <laughs> that And it, it is inspiring. I've had the privilege of working with a lot of internet pioneers as I've been working in tech policy over the years. And security and privacy are the areas where they feel like they did not create the kind of uh, internet that we really needed. It shouldn't have been built in much earlier. Yeah. It should have been baked in. So I'm excited about that prospect too. And I, I know we're gonna keep fighting for it for sure. A Couple of things that I experienced earlier in my career that I felt were helpful on the policy front were different initiatives like the Internet Governance Forum or maybe um, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or other fora that were a place where people could come together and really hash out these issues. A lot of this is happening more informally, right? Um, I, I think we're using the communications tools of the internet, right? Uh, the the discords, the even Twitter conversations, right? Um, to sort of debate and hash out um, some of these issues. I, I do think maybe having something more formal would be helpful, but I do also know that there are so many different uh, sort of topics and subtopics um, that people do sort of seem to be self selecting into different conversations. I, I also think it's interesting just the way that DAOs have evolved over time as kind of a, a mechanism for, um, you know, deciding the direction of a network. But, but yeah, I do, I, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of a traditional Washington person. Um, I, I think that uh, having strong organizations that can be um, a forum with a, with a proper structure is, is a good way to do this. I, I, it could just be though that in this internet age that it's happening, the same work is happening in, in a more informal context. But but yeah, I think, you know, I, I would like to see the emergence of those those structures. I, I think that's fascinating that you mentioned that it is kind of happening. And I suppose it is, but I'm not sure that the policymakers and regulators are there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, well, in the, and I think this kind of goes back to something you were, you alluded to earlier, you know, for policymakers, to understand how blockchains work and all of the features that you can add on top of blockchains, you kind of have to understand a lot about how the internet works, how data structures work. I mean, it, this is just a, a jargon that isn't part of, you know, the everyday elected official or even the everyday regulators, you know, like it's just not part of what they know and what they do. And so it requires... Um, not just education about, you know, how does a blockchain work or how does a ZK proof work or, um, you know, you, you really have to kind of take them back a few levels and talk about how does the underlying infrastructure um, in the in the analog world work. And, and it's it, it's a lot for people to digest. I mean, I run the Blockchain Association and I run into, you know, technical issues all of the time. Right. I mean, it's 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 a lot for somebody with a you know, non-technical background to understand. And so I think that's one of the challenges we have. I, I, I think it's interesting that 
the younger policymakers, at least the ones on Capitol Hill, tend to be much more open because they grew up in a digitally native world, and um, you know they're they're much more interested in um, understanding how you know crypto networks work and you know uh, the the ins and outs, and and they ultimately I think end up being better champions than you know the older members that you know grew up without the internet at all. And it, it, it's just a much greater leap for them to really understand the innovation that that we're looking at. Yeah, interesting. Well, let's uh, change gears a bit. Let's talk a little bit about why did you decide to start a blockchain trade association? <laughs> it, it is, that must have taken so much guts to do that when you- Yeah, you know, I well, so I, I can't take credit for it. I, um, I, I, uh, you know, careers are interesting, right? You have you have ups and downs throughout a career. I don't know anybody who's had just like a straight up career. And I, I feel like in my 20s, I had a sort of traditional working on Capitol Hill experience where I really got to dig in on internet policy issues and tech and telecom policy issues, which I was always just like super interested in. Like it's, you know, I, I also did like education policy issues. That did not interest me, but the tech and telecom, like the you know, seeing all of the new things that were coming out and figuring out how policy could help support that innovation. Like, that's something that got me, like, excited to wake up and go do every day. And so, um, you know, I did that for many years um, on Capitol Hill and kind of worked my way up. And then, um, you know, I I decided to take some time off and I wanted to move to New York and, and do something different. And, you know, that didn't work out. You know, I got to New York and people you know, I told them I worked on Capitol Hill and nobody knew what that meant and that nobody understood what skills that came along with. And I didn't know how to communicate it in a language they understood. And so um, I actually ended up not working for about a year, which was, um, you know, kind of, I think, a, a growth experience. But, you know, it's stressful um, to not have a job. And uh, <laughs> so um, anyway, as I slowly kind of got back into the world of lobbying in Washington, which was, you know, after all of my soul searching and finding a job in New York or attempting to find a job in New York, it turns out I just ended up back in D.C. uh, doing what everybody does when they leave the Hill, and that is to become a lobbyist. Um, But what I was looking for in in the years that I was doing that was, you know, trying to figure out what is a specialty that I could specialize in that is interesting to me, that gets me excited, like when I worked on internet policy, and that, that, maybe nobody else is doing like, like, what is the newest thing? And so I started looking around. Um, I learned about Bitcoin for the first time. I became really interested in that. And um, through just kind of my desire to learn about it, I ended up stumbling into a group of people who were wanting to form a trade association. And I thought, you know, hey, maybe if I help them do that, they'll hire me as like a consultant. Like that was my like, my goal, like should get hired by this new group as a consultant so I can work on these issues. Um, but it turns out they they wanted me to come in-house, um, not to run it, but to kind of help get it up off the ground until such time that they could find somebody else to come in and properly run it. Well, you know, like a year later, um, they just said I could do it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, at the time was sort of a bear market. This was like 2019. And so I feel like, um, you know, I, I can't take credit, but what I didn't realize at the time was, uh, like, I could build things. Like, I didn't understand what it was going to mean to take an organization from, like, literally nothing, right? We, like, they, I showed up. They were like, here's a bank account. There's a little bit of money in there. I'm like, all right, that's great. And they're like, and here's a website we started for you, but go. And I, um, you know, was totally unqualified. But, you know, if you look around and you talk to the people you're working with, the Electric Coin Company, was one of the founding members of Blockchain Association. You know, you ask them what you need, you figure it out, um, you get advice from your board, you can all of a sudden put the pieces together and start to build the team to get the job done. But yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, I um, and, and it's certainly, I think if somebody had told me from the beginning that I would be running this entire thing and building the whole thing myself, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. I would have been afraid, but I was sort of thrown into the deep end and, and learned to swim at the same time. And it's been absolutely the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my entire life. And it's the job that I think I was put on this earth to do. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here doing it. I love it. It's such an amazing story. And I was actually working at a trade association for the crypto industry at that time too. 
when uh, the Blockchain Association started. And I remember seeing the development of that. And uh, you, know, you could have taken the association in so many different ways. And there are a lot of examples of other groups that have formed that are doing that. But I appreciate so much the fact that even though you're now 100 members, you're very focused on the core policy issues of crypto. And your membership is, even though it's getting larger, it still has a whole lot in common. It's not a very broad-based organization that opens its doors to everyone. And you could have also made your organization all about a big event or like... The, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, right? it's... Yeah, it's interesting because the, the mandate I, that we that I was sort of given is we need to we need to get pretty good policy, right? Like that's what we need. We need pretty good policy for crypto. Um, and it was sort of like, all right, you kind of have to back up. What do you need? Well, we need uh, money. Okay, how do you get money? Uh, we need that by members. All right, okay, we have members. All right, now what do the members need so they're happy? Oh, they need pretty good policy. It's sort of like a a, a loop, and it's like, okay, so we need to be able to talk to regulators. We need somebody that can think of these positions because I'm not a lawyer. And so we were so lucky to eventually get Jake Trevinsky. There's like a side story that I tried to hire him back in 2018 and uh, that didn't work out. And so I, but you know, I say I always get what I want. It took three years, but we finally got him on board um, or maybe even four years. But anyway, it's, um, but yeah, you kind of have to think of what are the pieces you need and, and you just get feedback from people that are saying, you know, hey, have you thought about going to the Treasury Department? Oh, no, shoot, I forgot to go talk to Treasury. Great. Okay, who can we work with? Who, where, who has the relationships? And you just kind of build it and put it together. And it's it's kind of like a big puzzle, but um, it's a lot of fun. Building is awesome. Uh, I And it's hard. So I, Super hard. I, <laughs> Super hard. I recognize that and I appreciate it. And I'm, again, so thankful for, for all that you're doing for the industry. And what I see in the association, because I work with so many of your employees so closely, is that it's just a really high quality group. And that is evidenced by what has happened with the people that have worked with you. They have gone on to establish amazing organizations that you're still working closely with. They're going to work on the Hill. I mean, do you want to just talk about your team? Yeah, we've, we've, lost, we've lost four uh, uh, full-time employees. Um, we had uh, Miller Whitehill Savine went on to found the DeFi Education Fund, which is this um, amazing organization. It was funded by a, a Uniswap governance proposal, actually. And, um, and so we work very closely with him. It's focused, you know, exclusively on DeFi policy, which we also care very much about. Um, and so... Yeah, he's doing a great job. Um, we also had Jacob, who moved on to run the Filecoin Foundation's um, Washington office, which is great. Uh, we had Jay, who moved on to OpenSea. Um, and then recently, uh, Lindsay on our team is going to go work for Patrick McHenry on the Digital Asset Subcommittee. So we couldn't be more proud of her. And um, yeah, I think what I also, you know, it's you just learn as these things grow. But, you know, if you can identify young talented people which most of the time by the way isn't me identifying them it's either the it's just the people around me that identify them and um but if you can bring them in and work with them and treat them well and train them up they're you know they, they either can do wonderful things within the organization or they go on and do wonderful things that you know continue to support the cause outside of it so yeah i think of i think of our role is not only to you know, just be about the blockchain association, but let's let's work with the entire community to make sure we're all working together and have the resources and um, you know the relationships that we need. And so, if you think of our team as not being like a 14-person blockchain association team, but you know, if you all of to look at our membership, if you count, you know, you and Gary and our BA alum and the DeFi Education Fund and everybody, you know, all of a sudden there's. Uh, there's hundreds of people working on these issues. And if we can be the glue that keeps people talking together and coordinating, um, I think we can actually have an impact. Um, it may not feel like it this week when we see, uh, you know, Kraken and doing a settlement on staking and the Fed, you know, pushing, <laughs> publishing final rules and, and um, you know, whatever we have to come next week. But, um, but you know, we do have resources in place that have been working together. And I, I think that, you know, we just have to keep taking um, these challenges one at a time and working through them. And I think, you know, I think crypto's not going away. You can't put this genie back in the bottle. We're going to be fine. That's for sure. And uh, I just have to comment on like the growth of the organization, aside from just seeding 
all of these other things that your people are moving on to is like you're a kind of a training ground for the industry, it seems, here in D.C. But you, you've also just grown so immensely. Like just this last year, it's been remarkable. And I kind of have been through something like that. I know how hard that can be. How do, how do you feel about that process? Is that going well? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, I mean, we've sort of grown in two ways, right? We've grown in terms of our, our membership. Um, you know, we have around uh, 100 member companies right now. That is all thanks to Dan Spooler, who runs our industry affairs department. He, he is phenomenal. Um, but it, it's also because the rest of the team, kind of going back to before, like, you know, we're like in and out Burger. You go to in and out Burger to get the double-double, right? That's what they do. It They do the one thing, they do it right. Um, we are... A, you know, policy operation. We we help develop policy for the industry and we help advocate for that policy. And we sort of do one thing and we do it the best we can. And so I think it's having the rest of our team um, that that is really hyper-focused on that, um, that that in turn attracts more people to to want to be a part of it. So I, I think the substance, um, the substance matters. But yeah, it's it's certainly been a challenge. I mean, we we used to and this is maybe two in the weeds. You can cut the spread out if you want. But, um, you know, we used to have biweekly calls individually with each of our member companies. Well, all of a sudden, when you have 100 member companies, that's like impossible, right? And so um, that may have worked well during COVID when we were all kind of lonely and needed to talk to one another. But, um, you know, now we do one sort of big call for everyone every month. And then, you know, um, that frees up a lot of time for us to actually do the work we need to do. But also just growing internally, you know, we're a small team, but I think anyone who's worked at a startup and has worked on small teams knows, like, it takes a little while for everyone to figure out, like, what their role is. And, you know, I think kudos to the folks at the Blockchain Association, because we, um, uh, you know, haven't really had the most formal job descriptions. We've just kind of identified, you know, people who seem to really agree with our mission and that we're willing to work hard. And, we in and it's what what's been most fun is when people come up with ideas that I would not have thought of in a million years that are really good and that are really good for the the community and the industry and our membership and help advance our mission and so it's it's just been really fun to you know just like empower people and and let them figure out what what they think needs to be done and and it's taken a little while you know there's always little conflicts here and there but I think it's a pretty well well-oiled machine right now. Yeah, it's it's great. And, you know, thinking about that in and out burger reference and being able to do the policy work so well and be really focused on that is is a challenge when there is so much you could be doing. Yeah. I think maybe even I'm at a little bit of fault because I try to pull you guys into all sorts of new initiatives and say, we should be doing this. And that. No, I'm I sure love your that. initiatives. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure you're getting that. Your breakfast too. and no, these are all things that it's like, let's find a way to convene the community. Let's get academics involved. Let's get think tanks involved. I, I think this goes back to, though, you can't think of it as, you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a larger team, right? It's one big crypto policy team here in Washington, and we all have to take different pieces of it. And, and, um, and it's, um, yeah, there's too much work to do for, you know, one small team to handle. And so, um, is it a challenge to keep everybody on the same page? Do you have there's yeah. a lot of diverse opinions out there, right? How, how do you manage keeping everything running in a, in a yeah, no, voice? That's a great question. Um, it's it's a it's a it, it's hurting cats. It's it's a it's a massive um, uh, challenge, but an important challenge, right? Like I, I think it's better for the industry to work out their differences behind the scenes with each other instead of out in the public um, before policymakers, because that just sends confusing signals. Um, I've I've actually been surprised over time. For the most part, people are pretty aligned, right, within the membership. Um, you know, people uh, all support decentralization. That's part of being part of the uh, association. Um, people value preserving self-custody. People want clarity on securities laws. Um, you know, there, 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 there are certain policies that are are pretty obvious. Um, I, I think the devil gets in the details um, sometimes, and um, and that that can be really challenging. And and I think, you know, it's one of the things we're trying to do with these new working groups we're developing is start to have these conversations earlier in the process and start to work out differences. I think a lot of times when you get people in a room together or on a call together, you can you can start to work through and identify some of these things. There's often sort of misunderstandings that go on. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think, you know, convening people and, and talking things through. But, you know, if there's something that the industry is so divided on that, you know, you got one side directly opposite another side. I mean, we just won't be able as an association to advocate for one or another. Like we have to have consensus. And so um, it involves a lot of conversations. But I think our team has been really, really good at getting to know our members individually. Um, and, you know, newer members, we're still working to get to know them. But we have a pretty good sense of who cares about what issue, who has what expertise in what area. And so when something comes up, I mean, if something comes up on privacy, we're calling electric coin company, right? Like um, if something comes up on securities laws, we know all the securities lawyers that used to work at the SEC will go to them first. So a lot of it is just maintaining that communication and kind of knowing what people care about. And, you know, hopefully we can get the right people together and get them talking and to kind of work out those issues. But yeah, we haven't always been successful. Um, there's no consensus on what to do about the regulation of DeFi, if anything. Um, I think that's one that that is still in the early stages. But, you know, that's also a portion of the industry that's only been around for a couple of years. And so I think, you know, we just have to continue to having those conversations to convening people, bringing them together. And hopefully we'll get to a point where everybody can be on the same page. An area where this came to head recently, I think, was maybe in New York with the proof of work mining ban. Yeah. yeah. Proof of work mining ban in yeah. New York. And there some people have said that because the proof of stake groups didn't align with the proof of work that that really undermined the ability of the industry to be successful there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's interesting because if you look at, you know, proof of work and, you know, um, that that is, you know, a t different set of challenges, right? Because it's very energy intensive, as you well know, um, and uh, it just has a um, there, there's more targeted policy attacks at proof of work. I mean, we're now seeing this on the staking side, though, as well, right? Like we just saw, um, you know, restrictions and enforcement or settlement at the at the SEC. There's also tax issues specific to staking. Um, my message has been that, you know, f for the most part, most policymakers only see one crypto. It's all one thing. And so if you're on the proof of work side, you don't have to spend your time working on proof of stake issues, but you have to support what that group wants to do. And similarly, you know, um, Bitcoin is proof of work. We wouldn't be here without Bitcoin. Even Zcash wouldn't be here without Bitcoin, right? Like we are all coming from our father Bitcoin over here, Satoshi Nakamoto or mother Bitcoin, depending on the day. Um, and we have to figure out how to um, support Bitcoin because I think that's a huge part in the ecosystem. And so, you know, I've been pretty clear when we're talking with folks that are in the proof of work camp or the proof of stake camp, like, Again, you don't have to spend your time on it, but you got to let us advocate because at the end of the day, it's all sort of one crypto and an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And, you know, if they're going after proof of work one day, you know, they're coming after proof of stake next. So we need to make sure that everybody is allowed to, you know, stay strong and, and take those fights um, as they come. There's a good lesson there for sure. And maybe we just don't need to be maxis on any one thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. No, this is... A Except for... Industry generally, yeah. So we're crypto maxis, but uh, may, but maybe not all crypto. There's a you know some <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. the good the good American uh, non scammy crypto. There you go. Yeah. There you go. The policy summit was new this last year. Yeah, that was a big deal, and that yeah take a lot of focus and time away. How's that going? And what is the plan for this yeah. coming year? Do you want to like tell us what the date is or give us any scoop on what's yeah. coming? No, we we are, uh, we did our, well, part of this was because of COVID, right? I mean, no, there were no in-person events for a long time. Um, part of it was just bandwidth. We had a small team until, you know, about a year or so ago when we were able to, to turbocharge everything. Um, but yeah, we did our very first policy summit this year. It was, um, uh, you know, here in Washington at the Conrad Hotel. Um, and we had invited all of our members in uh, to join us and to hear from policymakers and convene and have conversations. Um, I do believe uh, we have signed a space for the week after Thanksgiving um, in November. Um, I might be jumping the gun here. Someone's going to yell at me later. But um, uh, uh, that announcement should be going out shortly. I don't know the precise days, but I think we're going to make it a little bit longer this year. Um, I, I think last year we had so much content that we didn't have enough time for conversation. And I think people really um, 
uh, value being able to talk to their colleagues in industry, to talk more with people in government more informally. And so um, we're going to expand it out a little bit. But but yeah, I think, um, you know, this kind of goes back to what we we're talking about before. It's it's all one big extended group and we don't all want to be doing the same things all the time. And if we can better coordinate, if we can kind of divide and conquer on different issues, um, I think we're going to be a lot more effective. And so we'll be doing that again in November, um, which we're we're really excited about. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think the industry is going to really need that around that time. After all that we've been through, and it's just, what is it, we're still in February, right? <laughs> yeah. And we're not even that far into February. It feels like, uh, yeah, getting to November yeah. is going to be quite an accomplishment this year. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I've mentioned uh, to my team and discuss that like it's kind of my personal strategy is I really want to try to find opportunities to do more engagement. You know what I would do with the with this podcast and with the breakfast and other things. What would you like to see members do now? What do you have any ideas on leadership gaps that are yeah, no, that's an built? interesting question. So there, there's a couple things I'd like to see more of. Um, we need more education, right? And I think the PGP breakfasts are awesome. I think in an ideal world, we would have a curriculum coordinator that would have every policymaker in the universe that we need to know. And we would make sure, all right, do they know the 101? Great. Okay, let's get them into the advanced topics. Like, who do we know that we can match them up with to teach them that? You know, I, I would want to obsessively track, like, every single person that's a decision maker and find different ways to get up, you know, get the information uh, to get them up to speed to where they need to be. That's probably a little aggressive um, and it, it ends up happening a little bit more organically than in, than that in reality. But, um, you know, I think that we need to, you know, um, have just more education on a one on one basis and a, and a um, in a you know a group setting basis um and then also have things like podcasts and um uh and online materials and um twitter campaigns and things like that so i think we can always do more education that is like never ending because we always have new people coming in and out um and so that that's like an ongoing challenge um i also think that we have a challenge with the influencers um i mean you've You've been doing crypto longer than I have, but it it takes a while to really understand what's going on. And I think there was sort of this interesting phenomenon that happened last year in that companies uh, in the crypto space, and rightfully so, got really excited about engaging in Washington. And they went out and hired policy people or government relations people or, you know, whatever term you want to use. Um, to work with policymakers on these issues. And the problem is that set of people who are hired don't actually know how much about crypto themselves. And so I think we also need to do a better job educating our influencers. And whether that be through a PGP breakfast-like thing that's targeted towards lobbyists and government relations professionals or, you know, just a a, a more aggressive curriculum when they get hired to make sure they know what they're talking about because you know it's it's i think there's a common um you know there's a, a common metric for success in washington is to get something done and so what we saw last year were some professionals coming in and were like well let's just cut a deal and get something done and what they didn't understand is the deal that they were pr being offered was one that would gut the heart of decentralization and what we're here to build. And if you don't understand what decentralization is and why it matters, then you're not really in a position to judge the, whether or not a deal is good or not. And so um, I think that we need to do a better job educating the influencers as well. So yeah, it's all education. That's an amazing insight. And I love the concept of being able to like track all the policymakers level of where they are. Yeah, I want, I want, I'm like the federal <laughs> government. I want to know everybody and what they're doing. <laughs> well, we've had, it may be ironic. I don't know. <laughs> well, some discussions I've had with policymakers have really shocked me. Um, I think it was uh, Congressman Davidson that we talked to once and he just knows so much. He's detail. so good. He's so good. He is not typical. 
<laughs> he, told, he told me things about Zcash that I don't like. Yeah, I probably didn't even know. It was it really shocked me. So yeah, it, yeah. It was. There are some people out there that are the policymakers that are just so amazing. So that gives us hope, and yeah. we we do need to do more education. I I'm hopeful that we can do some of that too. In fact, one of the PGP initiatives is going to be doing more hill work. So that's coming great. soon. Stay tuned for that. Great. great. Thinking about this in the much broader concept, and here I have to. Um, I'm thinking about my colleague, Gary Weinstein, who does global regulatory relations for Electric Coin Company. This is something that we need to work on across the world, everywhere. And that is... Like, it's overwhelming, it, isn't it? It is overwhelming. <laughs> I don't care does it. <laughs> well, when, when we think about the opportunities here, I think there's just so much more globally in so many places where we need leadership. Yeah. I'm curious what you think about that. I mean, just this week, there have been major developments in Dubai. We've seen mm -hmm. the in the EU, we've, we've had the, the MECA regulations or legislation come forward and the regulations are going to be developed. There's so much that's happening. Not my area of focus. I know it's not yours either yeah. specifically, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about yeah. it. No, I mean, I think in a perfect world, because we've gotten asked, blockchain association before like can you take on europe and no i can't <laughs> like i mean yes in theory we could um i i feel like we don't have enough resources to do washington at the way i want to do it um at this stage let alone take on another another country um but it's it's so important and i i do think there are you know whether they be trade associations or professional associations or other types of groups around the globe that are similar to, to what we do here. Um, it's, it's um, yeah, in a perfect world, I think you'd have one organization that's coordinating all of that policy, but in reality, it's it's a patchwork. And, um, you know, I think, I think the U.S. to me continues to be important, um, you know, because I, I do think we are an, a power in this world and that people follow what we do here. Um, but it is interesting to see you know, particularly in the EU, that they have really acted so much more quickly than we have here. And I think that, um, you know, at some point, that should be a nudge to policymakers here to kind of get focused and try to put a framework in place. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I think, it, I think it's a huge challenge. I don't have an easy answer to how you coordinate all of that. Um, I, I know there have been a couple efforts to try to bring various groups together around the globe and it's it's just um it's a challenge i mean that that in and of itself could be like the somebody's full-time job within our association right i mean we, we will jay when he was with us he um before he left uh, for open sea like he he was trying to build out all of these relationships which you know he did a very good job of but yeah coordination is really hard and especially when you start looking at different time zones and it's um yeah it's it's a it's a really big challenge i, I don't have an easy answer to that one Okay. Well, we'll have to work on that. We'll talk to Gary. Maybe we'll have a follow-up on this and brainstorm on solutions to, to fix the global issues. Yeah. I think we should just talk a moment about like the dynamics that you're expecting this year looking ahead. We've already seen a little bit of where things are going, which is very scary and disturbing. But Congress is now different. It's a new Congress. Yeah. And we have a new digital assets subcommittee in the House which, uh, for House Financial Services, which is really interesting. It, it would seem, if you, if you didn't see what happened this last week or two, you might think that things are looking pretty good, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, it's um, it's not a terrible situation in Congress. So, yeah, I, I sort of see a couple different venues where we'll see activity. Um Congress is one of them, right? And, and a lot of this is because of FTX, but a lot of this is also just because the market's been around for a while, crypto's been around for a while. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of congressional hearings. I think we're going to see a lot of legislation introduced. I think some of that legislation will make it through the committee phase, maybe even, you know, to the House floor. I don't think any of that legislation gets signed into law, unfortunately, um, or maybe fortunately, depending on what the bill says. But um, I would really love to see something around stable coins get enacted. I think that's ready, you know, that's pretty close to being ready to go. But um, I think I think we're going to see a lot of noise. Um, 
but also just like a huge opportunity for education, right? It's through these hearings and through the discussions around these bills that policymakers are sort of, at least lawmakers are forced to to uh, really dive in and understand these issues. And so I think this will be laying the groundwork, hopefully for, you know, legislation um, next Congress. I could be wrong on that. Um, I just at the moment don't really see the stars aligning where you have Patrick McHenry, the chair of House Financial Services, could, like actually agreeing with Sherrod Brown, the chair of Senate Banking, on how to move forward with a, a, a you know, to fill the gaps where where we might need um, new legislation. That's kind of one venue of activity. Um, another sort of venue of activity is what we sort of have been seeing this week, where you have the financial industry regular or the financial services regulators that are, you know, issuing guidance, putting out blog posts, um, spontaneously issuing final rules, um, do, you know, taking enforcement actions, kind of using their powers to try to shape policy. Um, and that, that I think is the, the scary part. Um, and that being said, I think we have tools, like I mentioned, to push back against that. And that's largely going to be sort of this third venue, and that's litigation. I think we're going to see, um, and, and we've already begun to see, a lot more companies um, push back whenever there, you know, is some sort of enforcement action. They're willing to spend the money, and we've seen this in the Ripple case. But uh, we've also seen this in cases where Coinbase is willing to come in and, and pay for um, you know, the legal bills for, you know, the tornado cash, um, you know, case. And um, we've seen kind of the flip side where Grayscale is like proactively suing the SEC. So I think we have um, a bigger desire to see, um, you know, bad enforcement actions challenged. Um, and I think, you know, what we talk a lot about internally at the Blockchain Association is, well, like, is there, what can we do proactively in a better you know, venue, uh, court venue to, um, you know, bring some challenges that, you know, where we're not playing defense, we're playing offense. Do you think that oversight hearings are going to have an effect this year? Like, is, is that going to slow down things that you know, like this? It's interesting. I, I think it's important to have the oversight hearings. And I, I think that, you know, Chairman McHenry um, on the House Financial Services Committee, I think that the, the team of subcommittee chairman under him there will be a lot of oversight of the SEC and other financial regulators in the, you know, in the form of hearings, in the form of letters, in the form of document requests. Um, I think that they're going to be pretty aggressive. You know, whether or not that slows down, you know, angry regulators, I think is an open question. I mean, I think in some ways they almost sort of thrive on the the controversy a little bit, but... Um, but yeah, I think it, it has the opportunity to expose um, and bring about um, some pretty negative headlines. And so, you know, I think I think that's a, that's a factor. And um, but yeah, it's a piece that that we need to have. Um, but I don't know if it's going to fully stop um, the effort that's underway right now. On the topic of oversight hearings, there's probably going to be a lot of opportunity for you to be before Congress, perhaps. What do you feel about that? And is that something you're up for? Yeah, no, I have um, I, I have testified before Congress before. I've done a, a lot of br briefings before Congress before um, and um, some federal agencies uh, as well. So, yeah, I, I think it's an important part of the job. I'm always happy to do it. Um, I, I also like it. Uh, uh, I'm really excited. We have Jake Trevinsky, our, our chief policy officer. Um, I want to make him do this. Uh, I think he um, is more substantive than I I am. But what what I found interest that's interesting about uh, particularly members of Congress is, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I, I can't get into the weeds of you know the specifics of regulation. But you don't need to have the conversation on that level. What, what, what the the best witnesses before Congress are those that can translate the ideas and use language that members of Congress can understand. And so I've gotten better at that over time, I think. I, it's always like an ongoing process. And so, um, but yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're ready, willing, and able at Blockchain Association to participate in any of these hearings. Um, you know, we also try to tee up uh, our members to be witnesses, you know, specifically if they're looking for a, a subject area that, um, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, somebody who works at a specific organization has expertise. We like to offer up those names as well. So we're, we're always, you know, providing suggestions for 
for people to testify. But yeah, I'm always ready to go. It's always a good excuse to buy a new dress. And uh, um, but uh, more importantly, it's um, you know defending the industry that I love. So I'm I'm always happy to do that. I'm looking forward to seeing you on the hill. Well, Kristen, I want to thank you. This has been, I think, a really interesting discussion. We've covered a lot. We've covered legislation, regulation, the courts, the history of BA, and where you've been. It's just such an amazing story. I am so thankful again for all that you do and your leadership for the. No, industry. I. Same with you, Paul. I mean, this is, um, I just have absolutely loved seeing what you've been doing in this position. And it's it's been awesome. And I think uh, I think what the work Electric Coin Company does is amazing. I think Zcash is awesome. And um, I think that uh, um, it's just great to have an ally that we can work with and, and try to solve and tackle these issues. Well, thank you so much. You can count on Electric Coin Company to help you develop pretty good policy for crypto. All right. For you. All right. Excellent.